Champions Mojo is part of the CG Sports Network. Welcome to Champions Mojo, a podcast to bring out your inner champion. Your hosts are sisters-in-law, Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds national and world records in master swimming. Maria holds world records in endurance cycling and won the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. Both are certified health and life coaches. Our goal is to inspire you through conversations with champions. And now your host, Kelly Palace. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast. And as usual, I am co-hosting with Maria Parker. Hey, Maria. Hey, Kelly. It's great to be here today. Yes. And before we give her a grand introduction, we want to say hi to our guest today, Erica Brown. Erica, welcome to Champions Mojo. Welcome, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yes, well, we are thrilled because we feel this is a fantastic opportunity to speak with you, such a champion. You are one of the top upcoming swimmers in the U.S. and the world for that matter. It's none other than Erica Brown. Again, Erica is a um, newly sponsored by Mizuno. She is fresh off completing an awesome first year as a pro swimmer in the International Swimming League and being part of the overall championship team for the ISL, the Cali Condors. Another team that Erica has helped be in the upper echelons of the NCAA is her alma mater, the University of Tennessee. Maria, what else can you tell us about Erica? Well, Erica, as you said, just keeps getting faster and faster. And she's just about done it all. Just a few weeks ago, she was part of the world record-setting relay with the Cali Condors. She's been a world champion, an NCAA champion, multiple-time SEC champion. She was a 21-time NCAA All-American and is the American record holder in the 100-yard fly. And only the second woman under 46 seconds in the 100-yard free. There's more on Erica, but let's go ahead and get to it. Awesome. So Welcome Erica, again. we, um, as you know, we, we've recently had two of your teammates on from the Cali Condors, Coleman Stewart and Townley Haas. And right. Maria and I were just um, speaking before you jumped on that you and Coleman actually have kind of some things in common where you're both like known for your amazing underwaters. You're both like super um, awesome backstroke butterfly combo. You throw in the freestyle, which is arguably your best event. So you guys, you, you do have some commonalities. The other commonality that, oh, unfortunately sh you share, you know, you know what it is, right? What? That your NCAA season, your senior year was cut short, mm -hmm. you know, so that both of you were on this path to be NCAA champions. Um, you know, fortunately for, for Coleman, he did have one under his belt as an individual hunter backstroke champion. But you, you did it on the relay, which is still awesome, but you didn't get that your senior year. So I just wanted to start out, um, you know, we wanted to start out just by asking you, how did you handle that when you missed NCAAs and what went how through your you mind? How did you feel about it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was devastating, um, especially at SEC's um, this past year, our team won. Um, we had an amazing group of girls going into NCAAs, we really felt like we were going to win at that meet. And obviously I had some goals in mind for my individual events. I wanted to get my first NCAA title. Um, so it's very difficult to have to deal with that just being taken away. But I think I was really able to take a step back and just cherish what I've learned throughout my years in college. And, you know, my coach said something to me and it's like, you're never not going to be successful. It's just, you might run out of opportunities. And I think mm -hmm. that is a perfect example of that. That yes. is beautiful. You're never not going to be successful. You're just, you may run out of opportunities. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. So in, in tuning into that a little bit, so Tennessee, you guys thought you had a shot at the title there for NCAAs. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. That's really great. That's, that's beautiful. So, um, my next question that we, we were talking about is how do you feel about being five foot six in a world of where a lot of these elite women swimmers are, you know, six foot plus? Yeah, I it definitely, I stand out for sure. 
and not because I'm tall, because I'm short. Um, but I think I was really lucky growing up. Um, my parents always taught me that I can do whatever I want to do if I believe and I have faith. And I think I was told several times by other people, it's like, oh, you know, you're not going to make it to that level because of your height or because you're really small. And I think I was able to turn that into motivation. And now that I have had success, I want to use my platform to show people that might look like just like me might not be six feet tall, that they can do the same thing. And you don't have to look a certain way um, to be successful in the sport. You use the word faith. And I know that you are a faithful person. I saw on your ISL um, page that you had a scripture uh, verse. Tell us how your faith has helped you succeed or impacted your life or your success in swimming. Yeah, well... I think just as a base, faith gives me a reason to compete because I'm not doing this for myself or any earthly reason. I believe that we are all given gifts and blessings and I was blessed with the opportunity to swim. So I'm going to use that gift and my abilities to the, to the best I can. Um, and hopefully that glory is given to Christ. Um, and then just through quarantine, I think my faith has gotten stronger because dealing with these emotions, you know, I'm so attached to swimming and it's kind of taught me that it's not the most important thing. It's another reminder that ultimately my faith and um, that relationship with Christ is the most important thing. What else have you learned about yourself through quarantine? Even something funny. I, you know, I was telling my, my husband this morning was looking literally the reason we were talking about your hair color is I've learned having not been to highlight my hair in one year. So my last time I highlighted my hair was at Christmas 2019. That one year of hair growth, and I, I don't know how I show it. I'm literally coming in strawberry red. So I've learned that I have red hair and we have it in our family, that I have a lot of red hair coming in. So I've, I've learned that, which is just, just a weird thing that I don't think I ever would have learned without quarantine. What have you learned? Oh my gosh. Well, I think I've learned a lot of things, but um, mostly that I don't know what to do with free time. I like to stay <laughs> really busy. <laughs> so having a bunch of free time has been different for me. What are you doing with it? Like, what, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? I think it's just caused me to find new hobbies. Like I've always enjoyed baking, but I've really gotten into baking, reading. It's helped me grow in my faith. I have been stuck on a Bible reading plan, which I don't think I have been as good at in the past. So that's been great. Um, but just saying organized, I just like to find so many little different things um, to keep busy. Yeah. Erica, tell us what, have been some other than COVID this last year and of course missing the NCAAs because of it what have been some obstacles that you have overcome and then how did you do that yeah I think the biggest one was my freshman year of college I was really struggling I am a big homebody so leaving my family and it, we were pretty far apart they lived in Maryland at the time so um, just being apart and feeling, I felt really lonely. Um, hmm. And then I wasn't performing well in swimming. So I really felt like I had nothing going for me. And I was able to go home that summer. And um, like I said before, my family and I are super close. And I'm so thankful for them. They really kind of brought me back down to earth and reminded me of my faith, reminded me of things that I would use as motivation growing up and reminded me that this is a huge opportunity and a huge blessing here at Tennessee. And I think having that community and my family around me, I was able to come back refreshed and it, it really helped me, even though it was such a difficult time, I think that it needed to happen. So you, the difficulty of homesickness and your first year and, and then to answer how you overcame it, it was, was, re, was, was, can you talk about that some more as reconnecting with your family? How, how did reconnecting with your family impact your, your swimming and your friendships and schooling and so forth and like that? 
Yeah, I think they really just reminded me to keep in check with my mentality. My mindset was very negative at the time, and I would wake up and just think that, think only negative thoughts. Like, this day isn't going to go well. I miss home. I don't really want to be here. I have to go to practice. But when I started, I really started, like, writing everything out, um, leaving myself sticky notes, really keeping in check with my mental health throughout the day. It can't be just at the start and at the end of the day. I figured that out, too. It has to be like every hour, okay, what am I thinking? What am I telling myself? And I turned all those negative thoughts into positive thoughts. I would get up and say, I'm going to have a great day. I'm going to get better today. I'm going to impact my teammate in a positive way, putting that energy out onto others. And I think changing that whole mentality really changed my whole perspective on life. How were you able to capture those thoughts like that? You know, it's most of us just think our thoughts, you know, and we don't even realize that they're negative or whatever. How are you able to do that? I think just getting in the habit of being really self-aware. Um, it's easy to tell when you start keeping in check with your mood too, because you those thoughts just come and go freely. But if you're feeling down and you don't really know why you're feeling down, I know that I have thought, okay, what have I been thinking about for the past two hours? And they're usually not positive, happy thoughts. Um, so I think it just took a lot of practice. Um, and then eventually I was able to narrow it down. Like, like I said, I started at the beginning and end of the day, and then I was able to do more and more each day, if that makes sense. Gosh, that is, that's powerful. That is and powerful. like really <laughs> like a PhD level mindset training. So you know, we, we talk a lot about mindset on the show and, you know, we always feel like our minds are a muscle, you know, like neural pathways, you create them and they, they build big, deep bridges when you're saying something negative and, or saying something positive. So, um, are you continuing to do that with, you know, checking your thoughts now every day? And in addition to that, what other mental training are you doing for that amazing muscle of our brain what, what are you doing for that do you visualize do you you know what are you doing yeah so to be honest I feel like I have not been as on track as I was I feel like in March when everything happened uh, with the pandemic I really got off track for a little while and I'm slowly starting to get back to that so it's definitely not easy it, it's a habit and it has to be every single day Um, So I'm working back towards that and it's gotten a lot better. But as far as other things go, I definitely am a visual thinker, a learner. I love um, in practice, we do a lot of video work and I love just looking at that, comparing it to other people, comparing it to my other swims and then using that to visualize for my races. So I definitely use visualization before anytime I race and or just in life, I think it's important if you set goals and you want to achieve something, you have to see yourself there. How did you learn about that? My family. My family is really, um, I'm super lucky because my parents have always taught me that you have to see something before you actually achieve it. And you have to believe that you have that before. And I think that's another reason why I chose Tennessee because um, Matt Kreditch does an amazing job at that. And he kind of helped even push me further into that. What do you guys do at Tennessee as far as your mental training? So in college, we actually had um, a sports therapist who would come and we would do 15 minutes of mental training before every practice. Yeah. So, so we would do that and then dynamic and then we would get in the water. So he would take us through it. It changed day to day, but for example, he would take us through, okay, a meet day, a warm up, our dry land training, our, our whole race, like from the start. And then after we visualized it, we would go walk over to the blocks and then get up on the blocks as if we're going to race. So I think that is something that definitely helped me um and then just as far as stroke and technique Matt does a really good job of breaking that down and visualizing it showing it to us like I said we do a lot of camera work um, which I find really beneficial 
Yeah, yeah. I saw so, this really cool video of you, and maybe <laughs> I'm not a swimmer, so I don't know if this is something that people do all the time. But you and a and a, and a teammate were in the deep part of the pool, and you were pushing up from the bottom, <laughs> and and then getting up as high in the air as you could. I guess maybe trying to touch something. Yeah, the flags. Okay. Maddie Vanek and I, my teammate. Yeah, just after practice one day, we always like to keep it light and fun. So um, we're both really competitive. Um, but yeah, that's just another example at Tennessee. We do kind of just different things. And sometimes it's just to have that light and fun energy or that competitive atmosphere. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of stuff like that. So uh, tell us what like were the main things that brought you from going, I think it was 50 point your freshman year in the hundred free to 45, eight, your senior year. Like that, that's just an incredible for a hundred, you know, that's, that's pretty incredible for a 500, but on a hundred. And then, and this is, this is, was a stat that just blew my mind. You hold the Tennessee record in the hundred free at 45, eight. The next person, the next time the record you broke was 47 six. So it's like, <laughs> it's just like, usually when somebody breaks a team record and Tennessee, you know, while yes, they've been great under you, Tennessee's been really good kind of long-term, you know, they, they're just, they've always yeah. been at the top, top, you know, top 10. So it's not like this was some slouchy little school that you went in and broke the school record. You broke the school record ten at Tennessee by almost two seconds. So um, what was the difference, like the main thing that kind of flipped the switch from your freshman year to your senior year? Well, I think one was my mindset for sure. I, when I got back there, I was just really telling myself, what do I have to lose? I'm going to give everything I have. Um, so like, I really worked on my underwaters. That's a big thing. Um, especially short course yards. I think that's something that really helped me in those races, I would just in practice, I would just say, okay, I'm going to do eight kicks off every wall. I'm going to force myself to do it because I'm going to get better. Um, so that mentality really helped me, but also the way I trained, I've always been a really hard worker and I would get in and grind, but I really learned the way the coaches at Tennessee teach the strokes. It's about posture and buoyancy and you know, we're in the water, it's, it's very different than on land. So I really learned a lot about the sport that I never had before. And I learned how to use my body in the water easier. So I'm still doing the best I can, but it's not as exhausting. And I think those combined really helped me. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That's, and really that's awesome. a, such a great uh, testament to the coaching there. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that that's that's really amazing um that they were able to help you with that that's great uh, well my, my next question would be you mentioned that you know you capture your thoughts and you work really hard on your mental game i guess what we'd like to know is what other routines or rituals or characteristics besides that may have made you as successful as you are yeah well i think i am always looking to get better in every aspect and I think that's really important is always finding new ways to get better so something that I've implemented is yoga and stretching um, and foam rolling lacrosse ball um, really tuning into every area in my body um, and then we worked with a guy his name is Phil and he actually works with the divers at Tennessee but he would do a lot of little tiny movements um, like core exercises, shoulder exercises. And we would do that. Um, one of my teammates and I, Tiasha, who she is still um, on the college team right now, we would show up an hour before practice and we would work on that. So I think those rituals that I created really helped me in the water. And it helps you mentally because it gives you more confidence because you know you're putting in the work. Um, but then just like behind the blocks, I have a routine I like to do. Um, just it's another way to give me confidence. It's something that makes me feel strong. I like to do like punches, which looks kind of silly, but it warms up your core. 
And then I just do a streamline to stretch it out. And then when I'm standing up on the blocks, you see a lot of people bend over, but I stand tall and don't bend over until they say, take your mark. So those are just some of my routines before a race. Like the Michael Phelps four arm flaps, you're standing up there. Yeah. I think that's, that's, right. that's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who's like the that. dancer at Michigan who gets behind the blocks and dances? I'm drawing a blink on her name right now, but Sierra, 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 Sierra. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Like she just Super goes fun. all out dancing, which I think is awesome. Whatever, you know, whatever it takes to get you pumped up. That's, that's really cool. So, um, now is everyone showing up at practice an hour early or is that something unique to you? Like you like to show up really early at things or tell us about that. Yeah, I definitely like to show up early and I would always, um, welcome my teammates. And like I said, Tiasha would come with me a lot. Um, but I think in college, I, was probably not the best student, to be honest. I really put swimming first over college. I still did well, but I, when most people were probably studying, I was figuring out how to get better in the water. So I think that was a, a difference. Um, obviously, other people would show up too, but I made it a habit. Wow. What, what, what did you study in college and and how is it helping you or has it helped you now? Yeah, I study kinesiology. So I think it actually did help me understanding how the body works. And especially if I've had some shoulder pain in the past couple of years, just understanding how it works and some exercises I can do on my own. Um, I think it's really benefited me in the sport. I was going to say, uh, kinesiology is not underwater basket weaving. You know, they're, they're, that's, <laughs> that's what we always used to say when someone was in something really easy, but that's, that's, it was I mean, criminal just, just justice to, in our school. Criminal okay. justice. <laughs> yeah. Just to get your degree in kinesiology is going to require something. So that, well, that's good. So you've really been a student of the sport, a student of swimming, which I think is, you know, is, is a, and also a student definite. of yourself. I, I yes. would say, I think that's, yeah. that's really amazing. That is, that is really amazing. So, um, okay, working outside of, of you, so now you're, you're, you're just back from Budapest. You've been six weeks in the bubble at the ISL meets. You're around a lot of champions beside yourself. You're right there with them. What do you see that these champions are doing? Like, what are some commonalities and things that you're observing that champions are doing? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is the mindset. Um, they're relentless in in their pursuit of success and nothing is going to stop them. And I was lucky enough to be teammates with some people that I really look up to. Um, so getting to learn from them in Budapest was a big experience for me. I, I'm so grateful for that. Um, but just seeing the way they carry themselves, something that I have been trying to work on is confidence it's it's sometimes it's hard to be super confident and you don't want to be arrogant or cocky I struggle with that so for example Caleb Dressel I think does an amazing job and just getting to hear him talk about swimming and how he approaches the sport um, it definitely helped me learn maybe how I can be better in that too yeah so we'd love to know who has inspired you, but maybe besides Caleb, like in, in all your history, like, is it a, um, you know, somebody that you swam with or somebody outside of the pool, but who's inspired you that's in your world? Yeah. Well, I think growing up, my inspirations were Kathleen Hershey and Carly Bispo from Texas to Texas girls, because when I was younger, I would go to the swim camps and I really looked up to them. They set great examples. Um, but even now, I think it's just my teammates. Uh, it's, it's easy to, when you're training with someone to motivate them. And when you receive that, um, I think that is so meaningful when you receive that back. So just, I get inspired by my teammates every single day and seeing them achieve something great makes me feel good too. And are we talking, sorry, Cali Condor teammates, Tennessee teammates, just anybody you're throwing on a USA relay team with or break down teammates for us? Yeah. So in college, it was really my college girls that that's who I was with every single day, but now I'm 
in the professional area of swimming. So it is amazing when I get to go like to Budapest for the Cali Condors. And I am so inspired by these people. And I think Budapest was unique too, because I got to train with them for six weeks. So we really get to know each other and create better relationships when you're with someone that long. So definitely my teammates on that trip um, and USA swimming trips in 2018. I think that's the moment I went to worlds in December in China. And that was the moment for me when I decided that I'm going to swim professionally and I'm going to have this as a goal of mine when I'm done collegiately because of those relationships. I had a lot of fears going into it just because I had never really been around such successful athletes and experiencing that um, and how kind they were really motivated me to keep going. So you thought, I want to be like them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the, so you, you are now, you've achieved your goal. You are now a professional swimmer. You're getting, you're getting paid to do what you're good at and what you love. Tell us how that feels and what, what you might say to somebody else who had that dream or goal. Yeah, I, it feels amazing. I think at, at some points it can feel kind of stressful because um, it's like you want something so bad and then as soon as you get it, you, real, you feel pressure. So I think I've had to work through that and just realize what a blessing and opportunity this is because I do love swimming. This is amazing that I get to do what I love every single day and not worry about anything else. And I would tell anyone with the same goal to keep working really hard and see yourself there because you can do that. Um, it's, it is a possibility. So it's definitely realistic. Yes. Well, you pro swimmers are definitely, you know, setting, you know, breaking the way because there's now little girls can look at you and say, I want to be a pro athlete, you know, and that's just really, really cool. I would love to have had that as a, as a young swimmer, thinking that that would have been an option. So um, what is next in the, so like, obviously Olympic trials are really like the biggest thing probably on your radar in the next six months or so or year. Um, but what is your, where are you going to be training? What are you going to be doing? Who are you going to be training with? What meets do you have between now and OT? And then the ultimate question we want to know is what are you going to focus on at Olympic trials? Okay. Yeah, so right now I'm training at the university still. Um, we're lucky enough to still get the opportunity to train there as a pro group. We can't train with the college team, which is what we would normally do um, most days a week, but we still get pool time and plenty of it. Um, our schedule looks a little different. We have different hours. We get to sleep in a little later, which has been nice. Um, but yeah, my main focus this year and next year is the Olympics and trials. So my mindset is really focused in on trials right now. And um, we suited up and raced last weekend just at our home pool. And I think in January, we have one meet planned with, I think it's going to be in Nashville, maybe. We're kind of waiting to see exactly what happens it's kind of been hard to plan things this year I'm sure you guys understand yes yeah, sure so I'm I'm just taking every opportunity I have to race um but that visualization has really been a key for me because if I can't race in as many meets as I want to I can at least go watch film of my previous races that have been good and see what I need to fix and then visualize that being even better um, and then after the Olympics, hopefully I make that team. I really believe that I can. Um, and then after that, I want to continue swimming. I, I say for at least two more Olympics. I love this sport so much. I want to stay in it. Um, and hopefully we have another season of ISL next year too. Oh, so, cool. yeah, that's great. So at trials, I mean, you're, you're so versatile, literally 100, 50 free, 100 free, 100 back. Hunter fly. Do you, do you feel like you're going to go for all of those and, and see where the chips, I mean, you, you know, who, who knows, you may come out as a, a six earn six spots on the team, but like, do you, do you visualize all of those as a success as someone that prepares? Yeah, I definitely train 
um, as if I'm going to make it in all of those events. So I'm prepared for that. I haven't decided fully on the 100 fly. I'm definitely going to do 50 free, 100 free, 200 free. I'm pretty sure I'll do 100 fly just because I, I have pretty much a perfect lineup. There's really no overlapping. Oh, that's So, great. yeah. And the 100 fly would be like my first event into the meet. So it would be a good setup, I think. Um, and I'm used to racing a lot of events. I raced the most I ever have at ISL. I raced a lot in college. So I don't think that it would hurt me. It might even benefit me. How, how cool. was racing so many races at ISL? It was more difficult than I thought it would be, for sure. Um, it was super fun, though. I, I was so excited to get up and race, especially on those relays. You're racing the best with and against the best in the world. So it was a feeling like no other, one of the most fun meets I've ever been to. All the lights and cameras, I think they did a really great job. So I really hope that gets to continue because it was so much fun. You know, one question that I haven't asked that I've meant to ask everybody who's been in the bubble is, you know, for those of us who, you know, aren't swimmers necessarily or are interested, what's just like, what was like a tradition, like a day like in Budapest when you're, you know, in the bubble? Would you get up and have breakfast and listen to music and then swim? You know, how, how did it look? Because you couldn't yeah, go so anywhere. For me, yeah, we, the island was a mile long and we were allowed to leave for 90 minutes a day, but other people on the island or off of the island, I'm sorry, could come onto the island. So I don't think many people went outside a lot, um, and it was really cold. But a normal day for me would look like I would get up, have some coffee, some oatmeal, do some stretching, then go down to breakfast. It depended on when we had practice because our schedule changed a lot. Um, but if we had a super early practice, I would eat breakfast after training. Um, and if not, I would go right down there and it was nice for every meal because your teammates are down there. You get to see people and the meals are prepared for you, which is amazing. You don't have to do anything yourself. Um, and then I would go to training and I had two of my teammates, um, Megan Small and Molly Hannes from Tennessee with me. So usually we would do a practice together and some people might jump in with us um, and then I just go back, do some reading, relax. Um, I, towards the end, I painted, I brought a nail kit. So I painted some of my teammates' nails. We would hang out together. Um, a big one, a big game we played was Uno. Um, Kelsey Dahlia brought a bunch of games. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but then I'd eat lunch in the dining hall again and maybe do a second training depending on the day and then go to dinner. Um, and then usually after dinner, we play more games or just relax. Sounds like summer camp. Yeah. Did you have roommates? Like no, we got our own room. So I am, I would say I have a bubbly personality, but I'm kind of an introvert. Oh. So it really, you had to push yourself out of your comfort zone to go hang out with people, get out of your room. Um, and it was really fun. I think it was a good experience for me too. That is so cool. And then how often were you racing? So if that was kind of a training and, and rest day, how often were you getting up to race? Yeah, so we had six matches within six weeks. So the first match was a couple days after we got there. And then we had eight days off to train. And then every match after that was about three days on, three or four days on, and then two days, three or four days off, sorry, of training, you get to train, and then two days of a match. So there was a lot of racing, not a lot of downtime, and it went by really fast. Who's giving you your workouts? My coach, Matt, from Tennessee would send workouts, and then we would do them. Um, and we had great coaching staff in Budapest. They gave, gave us an option to do theirs as well, but since we were there for six weeks and we're still training for trials, we just stuck to what we know. That is wonderful. Well, awesome. We've just, I, I just love everything that we've talked about. Um, we have our, our last question and keeping, you know, you in, in under an hour here. 
Um, is there anything that we have not asked you that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, I think just the biggest thing is what I've learned from the pandemic. I know we talked about it a little, um, but just swimming is so much fun and so important, but it doesn't define who you are as a person. I think that's the biggest um, reminder that I needed. And I think it's great to talk about. It is an amazing part of my life and so much fun, but it doesn't define who I am. And I think um, every athlete should know that and understand that. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's great. All right. Now we, if you've listened to the show, we have a fun little sprint around. It just helps people get to know you a little bit better. Um, so are you ready for a, a quick round of kind of one word answers? We try to give you that. Okay. All right. I'll do my best. Okay. Very right. easy. <laughs> Very easy. Yeah. Cat or dog? Dog. Red or blue? Red. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Oh, milk chocolate <laughs> kickboard or no kickboard no kickboard mountains or beach beach football or baseball football iphone or android iphone <laughs> <laughs> coffee or tea coffee are you a morning person or a night owl neither neither <laughs> cool and we know the answer to this one. Do you paint your fingernails? That's something we asked the women. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I always have my nails done. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, your manicures right, look really good. Uh, favorite color? Maroon. Favorite pizza topping? Wait a minute, wait a minute. We got to back up and hear that one again. Maroon? Maroon. I love, like, I, I don't think I've ever in my life heard anybody say that. I got to hear, why do you love maroon? I don't know. I just loved it. It's a great My fingernail color. I just, it, it is. And I think red hair wearing maroon just looks really nice. You um, should have gone to the University of South Carolina because, uh, oh. you know, that's they're, they're maroon and black. That's their colors. I know. I should have said orange. Yeah. I love that. I was kind of surprised. Anyway. I thought maybe your maroon was a variation, but I guess it can't be. Okay. Sorry, Maria. I, just, <laughs> I, had, to, I had to drill down on that one. Uh, favorite pizza topping? Pepperoni. Favorite vegetable? Ooh. Um, broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you. I love all vegetables. Okay, there we go. No, I love all vegetables. Okay, it's just hard to choose a favorite. All right. Yeah. Favorite swim complex in the U.S.? University of Tennessee. <laughs> Uh, something on your pre-race playlist. Oh, anything by Hillsong United. Anything by Hillsong United. Okay. Is that, do I have any more? Yeah, no. What's your shoe size? Seven and a half. Oh, that's my feet. <laughs> <laughs> siblings? Do you have siblings? Two younger sisters. Favorite Star Wars character? Oh, I, I've never seen Star Wars. Okay. We're going to have to change that question for these young swimmers. <laughs> yes. I always get asked that. And it's, 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 I need to watch it. That's funny. Uh, can you cook? Yes. What's your favorite? What's, your, what's, a, what's a dish you like to cook? Enchiladas. Okay. I love Mexican food. <laughs> okay. What word comes to mind most when you are just diving in the water off the blocks for a race? Um, what word? I would just say peace. I feel like overwhelming peace when I jump in the water. It just feels like meant to be. Oh, that's yeah. like I can answer. totally relate to that. Yeah. It's just like beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Erica, this has been just so, so inspirational for yes, me and, and me informative too. and I'm taking away a lot. We, I can't I, wait. I to love get how you, tickets. yeah. I love how you push yourself and you know yourself. You're, you're a great interview. Thank yes. you. Thank really, you so really much. Wonderful. I love being here. So much yes. fun. It's now time for the takeaways. Maria, you and I have heard the takeaways are the best part of the show. 
That's right, Kelly, because the takeaways are curated information, which is what we give to our clients when we coach them. If you would like to take your performance to the next level in health, life, or leadership, go to our website and schedule your free 30-minute consultation. Yes, just click on our coaching page and book there. We're looking forward to bringing out the champion in you. And now, the takeaways. So, Maria, we I, I'm just blown away at how much wisdom, and she's 22. I mean, that's not, you know, we, we, we always say that we feel like we get a lot more wisdom from the older athletes, but gosh, this was really impressive. What, what was your first takeaway? Yeah, she, she was amazing. She is younger by three years than any of my children. And, and, and she was, yeah, incredibly wise and a great interview. My first takeaway was she gave us a terrific tutorial in how to change your mindset. Um, you know, we, we asked her a little bit about mindset and she, and she said in her first year in college, she was very negative. She had a hard year. She went home and her family helped put her right on track. So there's that, you know, just getting back with people who love you and support you. But then she said she started, she put post-it notes everywhere to try to remind her. She, okay. First A, she, she looked for her emotions and if her emotions or her feelings or, or negative, she would think, what am I thinking about that's causing this feeling? And then she'd start writing things down on her post-it note. She started in the morning and the evening, and then she worked through, so she was capturing her thoughts throughout the day um, to turn them around. And I just thought, amazing, <laughs> amazing. I want to take that technique home. Uh, I, thought, yeah, I thought that was-, I, that was... I, I completely agree. I felt like I was kind of in a tutorial yeah. for like, boy, yeah, we all know that our emotions are driven by what we're thinking. Right. And yet we don't really reverse engineer that where we right. go back and say, okay, gosh, I'm feeling like crap. You just think I'll eat a chocolate bar and I'll feel better. But how about <laughs> it does I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling like crap. And what am I thinking that's making me feel that way? Right. And then and I'll, I'll really, and that can, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. And really monitoring it. So I, I thought that was a, a huge, wonderful takeaway of really writing down what you're right. thinking. And not and, and then she said, and, and this is not easy, and this is where I think her dedication and she's willing to really do the work yeah. is is to write it down and check constantly, like every hour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, I mean, she started by, I mean, it can be overwhelming if you're in a really negative. I mean, I can get there and, and, and sort of, it can be overwhelming. She said, I started in the morning and evenings and then I worked in. I mean, so that's a great, hey, there you go. Do it like that. Start in the morning and the evenings and then work your way through hourly to check your thoughts. Beautiful. Yes, yes. Your first so, one. Yeah, so that kind of ties into my first one. I think she is really a mental giant. Yeah. And that is, you know, when we asked her, when you're, when you're, in the, uh, you're at the ISL, you're with all these world champions, champions, world record holders, What's the difference? Their mindset, their mind. So when I ask her the question, which I think a lot of us want to know when you're, you know, when you're, you're not the typical package to succeed in whatever industry you're in, you think maybe I can't do it because I'm not tall, or maybe I can't do it because I'm not, you know, this, have this kind of voice, or I can't do it because I, I don't write this kind of uh, prose or whatever, you know, something. So she really said that that's kind of one of the things that inspires her is to show people that you can stand up there and be five foot six against, you know, six foot plusers and still do well because she believes that she can do anything. And mm -hmm. so I, I love that. So that's her mindset. So this yeah. is another mindset, which she sees herself being able to do, to do anything. And so this ties into my one that I haven't heard from any other champion that we've interviewed that she said she really reviews video. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that I'm seeing, you know, my husband is, is, you know, doing this golf career and he hasn't done a lot of video. We did a lot of video with him this week and it's really changed his mindset. So I, I'm just saying, think about what is there something that you're doing in your life that you could video? Is it just public speaking? Is it your posture? Is it, mm -hmm. if you're not a swimmer, obviously if it's a swimming or right. running, are you, are you videoing that? Because now all we got to do is throw our phones up on a stand or get a friend to, to video you in the, in the pool. So are you getting, you don't have to be, you know, at a high tech university like Tennessee where they've got underwater cameras and overwater cameras. You can just, you know, video with your camera. So I think seeing yourself 
being able to do things. And also really, if you can't see yourself in your mind, then you might be able to watch a video doing it. So I just love the combination of those two. Yeah, I like that too. And I, you know, I would add to that, you have to be a little bit fearless to be willing to stare at yourself or listen to yourself. And I think Kelly, you're really good at that. You're fearless about getting better and, and looking for ways to improve. And, 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 and you're a champion and she was too. And she mentioned that, you know, you, you know, what have you got to lose? Let's look at, let's look at, you know, you might, you might think, oh, I don't like the way I look there or sound or whatever, but you know, how can I improve? So I, I, I think that's a great one. And my second takeaway was- Maria, Maria, before you go on to that, I, you know, I never even thought about here, we're on video and we are yeah. on audio. I do hate to hear myself on, yeah. you know, like, I think that's a common podcaster thing that we don't like to rehear. Like Mark's like, oh, let's listen to your new episode. I'm like, no, no, I, I don't want to hear it. You know, so maybe that's, that's a common fair. thing. So I think, I think yeah. it is. I mean, I, and what we've, what's happened with us, I think is we've gotten used to hearing ourselves uh, and seeing ourselves. And so you, you get beyond that, but it can be, I think, well, I don't have, like to do it, but right, we do it, right. You know, we, we, we do, do it, it, but I don't, I don't like to do it. So I, I think, think I think you have to have a little bit of courage to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's good, the point. And point. I think you have it. And I, I do. And I, I know I'm, I have courage. In certain, <laughs> I'm trying to acquire areas. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So my second takeaway was, um, I loved, you know, this is classic champion finding ways to get better all the time finding new ways. So it wasn't not just in the water, not just underwater, it's not just mindset. She, she uh, said that she was doing yoga and stretching and foam rolling and showing up an hour early with her. Obviously she's inspiring people with her teammates and doing extra stuff to get better. And, and all of that to get to know her body better. Just so how, as we, you know, Kelly, you and I talk about this with the podcast all the time, how can we get better? You, you can't, if you really want to be at the top, and you really want to be extremely successful. You can't just say, well, it was pretty good. You know, I'm pretty good. I'm good enough. You have to always look for that little thing. Well, what can we do to get better? So I, I thought that was a great takeaway from, from that champion. Yes, yes. And my second one was the, um, the idea that, you know, you kind of alluded to it, that she is early. She's an early bird. She's thorough. She showed up early. That was, the, that was a thing that really stuck out to me was yeah. that she really um, is a student of the sport, right. you know, so you don't just, you know, if swim practice starts at three o'clock, you don't show up at five to three, you come early. Another uh, champion that, that did this, do you remember Natalie Coughlin? Yeah. Yeah. She, she totally, was there an hour like, early. she was there like an hour early. She yeah. liked to go, she drank her coffee. So I, I think I, I've always, I'm always attracted to this one because you and I both <laughs> you struggle. We, yeah, we, we both do. We yeah. both, we're both like, um, well, we've been to, to put this to a finer point on, we've been working on this, getting to our podcast early so that we can make sure we have the technology right before our guest comes in. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. We're yeah. So I, I just think, you know, if you're listening and you can take away something showing up early is always, it's always a de-stressor. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Speaking of which we'll, uh, wind this up so I can get to my next thing early. <laughs> yeah. All right, Maria. It was wonderful. Thank wonderful. you. I love you I lo so much. I love you, Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast with host Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Champions Mojo is produced by Cobra Media and a new episode debuts every Tuesday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Follow Champions Mojo on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Champions Mojo.